Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. I'm here with Associate Professor Neil Pembrook from the University of Queensland, who's going to talk on a very important issue of pastoral care. So when we sort of acknowledge the Indigenous leaders, past, present and emerging, let's also reflect on the pastoral care that they provided to one another, to the land and the pastoral care that we should be providing to all. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Take it away. Well, thank you, David, and thank you for your introduction. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, my field of research has largely been in pastoral care, um, but I want to talk about pastoral care within a worship setting. I wrote a book on that, um, Pastoral Care and Worship, uh, and then I got so interested in it that I wrote another book called Theocentric Therapeutic Preaching, um, so I want to uh, address just pastoral care through preaching. And as you can see from the subtitle, Healing and Confronting with the Gospel, uh, pastoral care, as I understand it, is about healing, comforting, supporting, sustaining, guiding, but it's also about challenging, Spe speaking a, a hard word in love, so to speak, but in pastoral care, we would do that very sensitively and pastorally. Um, so the, the confronting term sounds a bit strong, but it, it really comes from psychotherapy uh, where they use that term, but they similarly approach it in a very uh, sensitive, tentative way. They don't jump on people. But I think both aspects are important because in caring for people. So it will come out in preaching. I want to begin with a very general question, which is what is preaching? Um, I mean, some of the sermons I hear Sunday by Sunday because I'm a full-time lecturer at UQ in studies and religion, so I don't have my own parish anymore. So I sit on pews on a Sunday morning and I go to different churches at different times. Uh, and some of the preaching I hear sounds a bit like um, the Green Party at prayer. So in other words, it's all about socio-political issues, striving for justice, ecological care, ecological concern, climate change, um, and then a, a reference to God or, or Christ or the gospels tacked on at the end. Um, then I hear other, other sermons that, um, you know, are laying a burden on people, you know, the burden of getting out there and saving souls. How many souls have you saved this week? And I wonder in all of that, where's the grace of God in Christ? So um, my understanding of preaching is that it's a liturgical announcement. So it's happening in a worship setting or a liturgical setting of the grace of God in Christ. Um, so Paul Scott Wilson wrote a book, uh, I think it was called The Four Pages of the Sermon, and he said essentially uh, the four pages should be sin in the text, grace in the text, sin in the world, grace in the world. So I think that that's not a bad way to approach it. Um, it's not to say that, that uh, preachers should never talk about mission and evangelism or preachers shouldn't be engaging with important political social, economic, and uh, ecological issues. So don't hear me rejecting those things being brought into it. But I think it's in the context of the, announcing the grace of God in Christ rather than the politics taking over or you know, burdening people with all of the, the, the mission tasks they've got to get on with for the week. Um, So just to, to quote Paul Scott Wilson again, um, he, he distinguishes between teaching in a sermon and preaching in a sermon. And he says that teaching and preaching both need to be there, but um, teaching in a sermon helps the listener to understand the text better, what's going on in terms of the culture, the history, the literature, the, the religion of the day, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 
um, but preaching in a sermon reinforces our deep sense of being redeemed through the grace of God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So I think that's also important that, that you know, some sermons I hear, there's a lot of teaching going on. I heard one not so long ago where it was all about uh, Valhausen's four source hypothesis for the Pentateuch. So, um, the priestly source, the Deuteronomic source, the Yahweh source, and the Eloah source. Um, that's fine at a theological college, but the people on a Sunday morning need to hear about Valhausen's hypothesis. Um, probably not. So that's sort of a general background. I want to talk about therapeutic preaching. Um, the word therapy clearly refers to healing. So we go to our GP and they, they can prescribe some therapies, perhaps some pills or some exercises or diet. But it's also got a link to counselling. So we talk about psychotherapy. Um, and I, the reason that I'm interested in therapeutic preaching is because the sermons I mentioned about what are you doing to uh, be part of the solution to climate change, what are you doing to push the government into a more compassionate stance with refugees, what are you doing to shift the focus a bit about uh, saving souls, about mission, about evangelism? Um, that people come along to church for Sunday, in my experience, and many of them are under burdens. And the stresses and strains in their relationship, their marriage is not what it used to be. Um, maybe they've got a son who's got profound disabilities, who's given them a difficult time. Perhaps there's drug abuse in the family. Perhaps at work, uh, the person's being bullied but can't leave the job because they need to pay their mortgage. Maybe they've lost a loved one, lost a pet. You know, the, these are so, this is life. You know, people experiences the, the swings and roundabouts, the vicissitudes, the ups and downs, the existential crises, the stresses and strains of life, and they come along and they get burdened and burdened with all the things you've got to do. So sometimes they just need a bit of care, a bit of therapy. Um, so for me, a very important thing about, about therapeutic preaching, where you try and bring healing, support, um, comfort, is that you don't want it to be human-centered. You want it to be theocentric preaching. So what's human-centered preaching? That, that's where um, you know, the preacher says, oh, perhaps you're feeling stressed at work. Uh, I've just been reading this excellent self-help book on how to deal with stress at work. Um, there are some mindfulness techniques that you might use. So I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes of my sermon talking about these three mindfulness techniques from um, such and such a book that I read last week. Uh, or have you ever thought about cognitive reframing? If you're a bit anxious, stressed or depressed, cognitive reframing is for you. So here are three techniques of cognitive reframing. So if you go back to the 50s when psychotherapy was kicking off and, and becoming huge in the US and then a bit later in the UK, Europe, Australia, Canada, people started to get interested in counselling psychotherapy. If you're having problems in your life, go along to your counsellor. Um, so at that time, preachers wanted to draw on these new insights and bring it into their preaching to make their preaching relevant. So what I did for my book was I went back and read all of the books that were out in the 50s and 60s and 70s that were on therapeutic preaching. And it was, a, well, it's a strong word, but I would have to say I was appalled. They followed a very similar pattern. And it was the, the pattern was uh, they'd take a text from the, the gospel or the epistle or the Old Testament reading of the day, just a verse or two uh, that seemed relevant to what they wanted to say. And that was sort of a springboard into uh, this lecture, really. And they'd say, oh, so we're talking about uh, stress in the workplace. Professor Sanso is a, is a world expert on stress in the workplace. And he offers these techniques so I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes telling you about these three techniques from Professor So-and-So's wonderful book. And, and literally, 
these were the way the sermons progressed. And then there was a little paragraph in the sermon at the end where the preacher would say, and getting back to our gospel text, Jesus uh, was a wonderful healer of anxious people and God uh, will bless you through your grace, through his grace, as you apply these three techniques of Professor so-and-so. So that was kind of the, um, the reference to the text, to Jesus, to the gospel, to God. One paragraph at the end, and then 20 paragraphs on human sentence uh, solutions to a human problem. Um, so I wanted to say, well, what about centering the sermon on God's ther therapy? That's why I called the book um, Divine Therapia, Divine Therapy, because it's about God's healing and because the scriptures are largely about God, God's grace, God's grace in Christ, the power of the spirit, the transforming love of God. That's the healing power of the scriptures, um, not human-centered solutions. So when I was struggling with what to call the subtitle of the book, I chose the Theocentric Therapeutic Preaching. So the, the title of the book is Divine uh, Therapia, Divine Therapia, Divine Therapy. Um, and then the subtitle is Theocentric Therapeutic Preaching. And I thought, you know, do you really need the word theocentric in the title? It isn't any preaching God-centered, surely? Um, is it a bit like the name of the Children's Hospital in Edinburgh where I did my PhD? So um, my wife was a nurse and we, we, she was looking for a job and we went past this hospital and I had to laugh. The Royal Hospital for Sick Children. And I thought, do you really need that word sick in there? Doesn't hospital give it away? Um, but the, you know, the Scots are very thorough people. Um, but I thought, well, I really do need that, type, that word theocentric because so much of the preaching I've been researching was all about humans, about this expert in psychotherapy, this expert in uh, whatever it might be, mindfulness or something. So why does God get shifted off to the wings? I guess um, God gets de-centered. And I think it's because preachers on the whole um, really want to be relevant and to, to engage their listeners. And they think if they bring in the latest thinking from pop psychology, that's more likely to get people interested than going back to the ancient text of 2000 years ago. So just to recap on what I said earlier, um, therapy of preaching is pointing listeners to the divine therapy, to the divine therapy. So, uh, you know, the Bible is about God's action in human history, about God's grace in individual lives. So that's what preaching should be about. Uh, God's therapy is, according to my book, God's healing love expressed through compassion, acceptance and forgiveness. That's comfort, but also through confrontation and challenge. And I don't mean to reiterate a very important point from earlier in the, in the talk. I don't mean a heavy handed finger pointing exercise. I think that's arrogant and off putting. Uh, there's ways to challenge that are respectful and I've got a sensitivity about them. So while I don't want to, to make human thinking the center of the sermon, I do make the case in my book that uh, counseling theory can be a useful tool to analogically speak about divine therapy. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about it, you know, there, there, there is no pure fund of God language. There's not a, this little pool of language that we go to, and these words only belong to God, and we only use these words when we're talking about God, 
And then over here is the everyday pool of language where we use that for our everyday transactions. Think about what happens in the, the Bible. In the Bible, it's filled with metaphors and analogues that tell us something about the nature and character of God. Why? Because there is no other way to speak about God except through analog and through analogy and through simile and through metaphor. All God talk, all theology, all biblical language is ultimately metaphorical. What do I mean by that? What about God is a shepherd? God is like a mother with the child at, its, at her breast. God is like a mother hen. God is like a rock. Okay, you get the point? God, um, we could name many, many others. That's what we do all the time. It's the only way we can talk about God. So I think we can have a fund of metaphors for divine therapeia that are based in the text that we're preaching on, but are also sourced from counseling theory. But I'll say more about this a bit later. So there, there is um, two types of analogy in theology. Uh, one is analogia entis, and is analogia fide. That's the Latin terms, obviously. It means analogy of being and analogy of faith. So analogy of being is more kind of the Roman Catholic tradition, starting with Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century. But um, we find it in a modern Protestant in the 20th century in Paul Tillich. That's T-I-L-L-I-C-H, Paul Tillich, German-American theologian. Um, so what's analogia? What's the analogy of being, analogia entis, that Aquinas would have used? Well, it's drawing an analogy between the being of God and the being of humans. So um, if, if we think about uh, human beings, we think about what's very noble in a human being, what we value, what is most um, uh, celebrated in the scriptures, we might think of something like love. So human beings that are loving reflect righteousness and holiness and goodness. So then we ask the question, well, where, would, where did that love come from? How, how come where our nature is to love? And then if you do a little bit of analogia entis, uh, as Aquinas would do, you'd say, well, we can learn something about what, how God must be, even independent of the scriptures. Rationally, it must be the case that God is the cause of the love in human beings. So this infinite source of love causes love to be in human beings. So this is sort of analogia entis. Now, Karl Barth, who is a um, Swiss reformed theologian in the 20th century, and by the way, an opponent of Paul Tillich, didn't like it at all because he thought that um, this would be distorting the true nature of God by somehow um, drawing an analogy between weak, sinful human beings and the infinite God. So he proposed the analogy of fide, the analogy of faith. And what he said is that the likeness of the word of God in the word that is thought and spoke, spoken by man is what he means by the analogy of faith. So in other words, we know that Christ is the word of God. Uh, and the word of God is witnessed to in the scriptures. But how is this word of God witnessed to? Well, by human words, by human thoughts, by the writers of the Gospels. And they, they can't capture in any pure, complete way the word of God because human concepts, human language are always limited. So the analogy of faith is the way in which the word of God is reflected by the human word, human thought. That, that's what he's getting on about. So the main thing to know about this is that what Bart is doing is doing analogical thinking grounded in the scriptures. Whereas what Aquinas is doing, analogia entis, is a natural theology 
where the theological work is grounded in the nature of the human being. Now, I should just add this little writer. Thomas Aquinas was very well versed in the scriptures. And if you read his theological writings, they're filled with scriptural references. So don't think that he never, didn't know his Bible and didn't refer to the Bible extensively. But it's an important point. And in my book, I say, I want to really do analogy of faith rather, rather than analogy of being, but there'll be some analogy of being in there, but I'll focus mainly on analogy of faith because I want to ground everything in how the word of God is presented in the scriptures. So I want to, want to make these things clear too about my model for doing this kind of preaching. I'm not saying that therapeutic preaching is the best form of preaching. I'm not saying it's the only form of preaching that's the last thing I would want to say. There are many different forms of preaching. All I'm saying is that sometimes you should do therapeutic preaching, and when you do it, do it properly, which is to make it theocentric. These are my simple claims and arguments. So preaching is first and foremost concerned with forming a Christ-centered community, and therapeutic preaching is only one way to do that. So I think I've already made the point about, I'm not just about helping hurting and confused individuals to cope better with life and to experience a bit of freedom and a little bit of hope, but also some sense of confrontation. Um, so the right way to go about this is to make preaching thoroughly theological, that is to center it on God and the word of God in the text, uh, the wrong way is to focus too much on human problems and human wisdom. Now, who, who are some of my interlocutors, the people I engage with? Well, one of the, the earliest representatives of therapeutic preaching was the famous American preacher from the Riverside Church in New York, Harry Emerson Fosdick, who said preaching can be personal consultation on a group scale. So it's like counselling on a group scale. He said he wanted to talk about the counselling ser sermon. Now, I, didn't, I don't really like Fosdick's approach very much because what he did was um, he let the text fall away and got very involved in the latest theory from this expert or that expert, this psychologist or this uh, researcher. And it was really a lot, fairly human-centred. So... I look at Fosdick and say, not really theological enough, not enough references to the word of God, to theology, to God talk, a lot of talk about human, human humans' problems, analyzing human problems, humans who solve humans' problems, but you know, God gets mentioned in the last paragraph. Um, so I wrote the book because for two reasons, largely. One is because some preachers seem to forget that people come to church each week battered and bruised by life. So that was my point earlier, that you know, preachers say, okay, you're all coping very well. Uh, in fact, I've, I've heard one preacher say more than once, don't expect me to do the warm and fuzzy preaching. I'm not here to comfort you. The, the gospel is very demanding, so get out there and save the world. The world's in a mess, get out there and save it. Um, so, you know, that's okay sometimes, but what about healing grace? What about the comfort of God? What about the support of divine grace? Uh, people are often battered and bruised. You know, they don't want more stress and strain and guilt piled on them. This week's task to do are save the world, save the whales, save lost souls, save the environment, these are all important things, but you know, people need to hear that God loves you, God heals you, God supports you, the spirit will uplift you, the spirit will transform you. Um, the second reason I wrote the book is that so many of the therapeutic sermons I read in my research were delivering mini doses of psychology from the pulpit and calling it a sermon. A sermon is a liturgical announcement of the God, grace of God in Christ through the power of the spirit. So with that um, kind of overview, I might stop my share so we can talk. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Have you noticed with COVID, has that the preaching changed become more kind of 
therapeutic because I'm noticing a lot of priests talking about the impact that COVID has. A lot of sermons sort of start with the same real suffering. Yeah. Um, look, the church I go to, that has not impacted at all. The, the, the sermons uh, are pretty much issuing a challenge, I would say. So I, I can't really comment because I'm not shifting around as much as I used to. Um, because I've become more settled and you know I'm in, in this particular church and I'm trying to you know get more involved. So I'm only hearing the one preacher pretty much week by week. So I can't really comment more widely. Um, and the church I go to, you know, the sermons tend to be of the more challenging type. Um, you know, challenging people to be more engaged in the world and to represent Christ in the midst of all of the political and social and economic challenges that the world's facing, you know, do more about climate change. So that, the fact that COVID hit hasn't stopped that or hasn't changed that. Uh, I, I do expect that, that quite a few preachers would try to respond to COVID and, because we know COVID is creating tremendous stress and anxiety. Psychologists are reporting seeing more people that are overwhelmed there are more people who are uh, going to their GPs and getting tranquilizers for the first time, antidepressants. It's interesting what you said about, you know, needing that um, therapeutic preacher, because I had someone come up to me in church not that long ago saying, uh, when you do the intercessions, can you uh, please sort of make reference to the fact that there's a lot of people hurting for various reasons. There were, yeah. there was, there were some losses um, and there were just a lot of things happening. I said, can you please mention that? Because I think the people in the church could really can really um, benefit from that and it's interesting because we could also have said well we should also put it in the sermon so yeah, not just in the yeah, yeah I, I think that's right that you know I, I gave that long list of existential crises and hurts that people can experience uh, and it is really life you know I mean who amongst us it just has this dream run where everything just going beautifully day in day out you know that only happens in Pleasantville you know <laughs> and it doesn't happen in the real world and how do you think churches will react to this type of preaching do you think they'd be resistant to it or they would embrace it um, I, I, I think that it's a difficult message to to get across I, I was aware of that um, you know if I was worried about my ego I would have published a different type of book because there are some books that you know will be bestsellers um, and other times you pu publish a message because you think it needs to be heard but you're under no illusions that it's going to have a giant pickup. Um, I think it's a difficult difficult message to get across. Uh, in the mainline Protestant churches in Australia, uh, Canada, the US, that there's been a big shift towards um, socio-political preaching. So the, the prophetic style of preaching is very strong. Um, and amongst uh, evangelical preachers, you know, the emphasis on expository preaching and um, particularly challenging people with, with outreach is also very strong. Um, and the, the, the few examples that we've got of books on therapeutic preaching in recent times, you know, I've thought are quite lacking. Um, so I think it's a difficult message to get across, but it's an important one. And I, I tried to stress in the book, as I did in the, the talk, I'm not trying to say, hey, this is the way you should preach every Sunday. This is a way you should preach from time to time as the text that you're using demands it. You know, not every text is, is aligned with a, a therapeutic message. So I'm not saying manufacture it. Not, I'm not saying cherry pick text to fit the model. I'm just saying that, that in the cycle of preaching, there should be a sprinkling of therapeutic sermons. And when you do it, just make sure it's God centered. Mm -hmm. With pastoral care sort of uh, broadly, do you, do you think it should sort of dictate more uh, how sermons are done? I, I saw a documentary uh, called The Outlist. Um, I think it's called The Outlist about um, people who were gay. And they talk about being at church and then hearing the priest condemning um, 
them. And they sort of just sitting there going, just that feeling of here I'm in church and there's this priest that I look up to who is there condemning. Uh, do you think that for, from a pastoral point of view, we should be more mindful of what is said at the pulpit during, say, sermons, how, how the impact it would have on people? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very sensitive to, to the problem for some of those who are in the conservative Christian camp who feel that they've got an obligation to talk about what uh, you know, would be a God-honouring life, would be a truly righteous life, uh, what ethical conduct is required of us. Um, so a good example for me is that when I was doing my PhD at the University of Edinburgh, um, I was writing about shame and how to, to provide pastoral care for people who suffer from shame. So shame is feelings of uh, low self-worth, uh, feeling, feelings of, in the, the extreme case of self-hatred. Uh, I'm not good enough. I don't measure up. I'm deficient. I'm dirty. I'm unclean. I'm not worthy. All of these dark, ugly thoughts are what make up shame. Um, and so he said, oh, you must go to this particular Anglican church in the city. And um, he said, you know, there, there are a lot of people who would be in your category, you know, but not, not my category as a person necessarily, but in the shame category. So I went along and there were, there were people who were part of the gay and lesbian community. There were people who had come off the streets. There were ex-prostitutes. Um, there were drug users. Uh, and, but the, it was an Anglican church, but of the more conservative variety. And, and I was talking to the priest and I said, you know, I've been in your sharing groups and I've talked to a lot of people in your congregation. I've been coming every Sunday. And all of these folk who don't fit the kind of classic, you know, uh, good, clean, living, evangelical mold are, are very happy here, you know, and they feel loved and welcomed. They, no one says to me, oh, look, you know, uh, I come here to hear the message of Christ, but I often feel spurned and rejected and not understood. I never heard that from anyone. And I said, what the heck are you doing? You know, and he said, well, you know, it is true that we have a, a conservative theology, you know, we're not um, laissez-faire and, you know, the, there are no ethical standards and Christ taught that anyone can do whatever they want. But we just let people find their own level, you know, that we, we don't, uh, harangue them from the pulpit. You know, we, we preach a message of grace, um, of the saving power of Christ, the way Christ transforms human beings who are caught in the darkness of sin. But we don't target people, we don't harangue them. And, you know, it takes a long time sometimes for people to make changes. Um, and I thought that was you know, quite a beautiful way to do it. Um, uh, you know, of course, if a preacher is... A, a liberal Christian preacher, the issue doesn't arise because that, that, that they'll get up there and say from the pulpit, um, you know, that, that people in, in the gay and lesbian community uh, not only are welcome here, but we, we say that God affirms your sexual choices and your sexual orientation and, and your sexual life, you know. Um, so the, the issue there would more, more be and from a pastoral point of view, what about the listeners who are scandalised by that and think that the Bible says that homosexual practice is a sin and should be condemned, you know, how to deal with the flip side, really, not the gay person feeling rejected, but the conservative who's in the congregation who feels that, that the Bible has been treated very shabbily. Um, but, you know, I'm certainly... Oh, you know, of that mindset of that church in Edinburgh, that you you treat people with a, a great deal of love and respect and sensitivity, and you don't ever point the finger at them. Uh, that's for sure. In, in pastoral care, more broadly, do you think people are kind of on the same page about what is pastoral? What is how, you know, how should you care? You know, we hear tough love, or that's not you know you're not helping them by doing that. Do you think there's a lot of division over what pastoral care actually is? Yeah, there's a huge 
split. Uh, and the split is between those at the extreme end to the right, if we're talking about um, fundamentalists and conservative evangelicals, who see pastoral care as largely um, centered in the Bible and prayer and psychology is contaminating and it's of the world, it's not of God. God's word is all we need. Um, so that, that would be one and the extreme end of the right. What's happened to pastoral care in America on the left, you know, liberal Methodists, the liberal Anglicans, liberal Lutherans, uh, is that they have converted pastoral care really into um, socio-political activity. So they say that um, when a gay person comes to them, feeling depressed and traumatized by the way they're treated and vilified, they say, well, you know, I can sit here for an hour and comfort them and listen to them and be empathic, but that's not gonna help them in the end. What's gonna help them is changing societal attitudes and seeing marriage equality become a reality. So let's get out on the streets and protest with everyone else of goodwill for marriage equality and an end to vilification and marginalization of gay people. So they've converted it all into um, socio-political action. So pastoral care will be in America around the Black Lives Matter movement. Let's go and support uh, the, the movement to um, overcome racism, systemic racism in America, rather than, you know, an African-American comes into your study feeling shattered by life and feeling left out and on the fringes and you'll spend an hour praying with them. That's no good. That's not going to help, you know. Mm -hmm. So these, and then there's the in-between, the middle ground, which I'd like to occupy, which is to say, oh, yeah, sure, you know, you really should. If you would care for people, you've got to care for the world, but you've also got to care for the individual. So maybe spend a, a fair bit of time with an individual, you know. So um, that's sort of a very rough mapping of, of the spectrum, I will say. I had someone say once about university chaplains that, oh, you know, there's no real value because all they're really doing is sitting down with someone with tea going, how are you going? Yes. And they didn't see value in it. You, what, what would be your response to that? Yeah, well, I, I love that little expression, uh, which is the play on the activist. You know, the activist says, uh, don't just st stand there, do something, you know. Uh, but the pastoral care person says, don't just do something, stand there, uh, you know, which is really about being with. So I see pastoral care largely as being with, you know. Um, I... When, I guess the big error that I think I made in my early expression of pastoral care as a pastor in a parish was, was that I would be endlessly sort of empathetic, you know, and um, supportive. And yes, I'm listening, active listening. That's got its place, no doubt, because so many people listen very poorly. But then I realised that, you know, hang on, th these people have actually got concrete problems and there is a way to find a solution. I mean, obviously, when you're doing pastoral care, you're not dealing with um, bipolar disorder <laughs> where there isn't a solution, um, you know, like an easy fix. But, you know, what if someone's saying, you know, a very practical problem like, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're really stressed at home. And then you say, well, what, tell me about your home. Oh, yeah, well, my husband works uh, 70 hours a week and I work 60 hours a week. Uh, yeah, we've got five kids, you know. Uh, and they all, they're all in 15 sporting activities and 10 musical activities. Do we're stressed at home? Well, you know, rather than saying, oh, so you're stressed at home. I hear you saying you're stressed. <laughs> what about saying, well, maybe think about re-establishing priorities and, you know, Don Browning in his book on, you know, Christians and marriage suggested that the combined working hours shouldn't be any more than 60, but you guys are working 130. Can you see an issue there? You know, like, so being a bit more practical and grounded and so, so let's find a, um, a solution because sometimes, 
you know, when people come to you, there is a solution, right? Mm -hmm. And you might not want to give up your, you know, your job that you love that's requiring you to work 70 hours a week, but do you, do you value your relationship, you know? Do you value your relationship? Maybe, maybe you need to. And, and so, I mean, for, for me, pastoral care wouldn't be, you know, prescribing, telling, advising, this is what you're going to do. You go home and you tell your wife that you're going to give up your job. You know, I would never do that. But, you know, I would say to the person, um, uh, this is a possibility for you. What about? Have you thought about that? What would be some, some positives in that? What would be some downside? Let's talk about that. So, you know, they've got to find the solution. They've got to work through the decision. But I could be more active than simply saying, oh, I hear that you're very stressed. I'm sorry to hear you're so stressed. That must be unpleasant. Mm -hmm. I, I was hearing a lot within the Anglican Church recently about domestic violence within Anglican um, households and what we can do about it. A therapeutic preaching, how would that sort of be involved with, say, people who come to the congregation where domestic violence is part of, of their household? Yeah, well, again, you know, the, the tradition I come from, and certainly the Anglican tradition, the Roman Catholic tradition, the Lutheran tradition, is the same, but there is a lectionary, you know, and, and I'm one of those that might be committed to the lectionary. In the United Church, we've, we've got an option, you know, we don't, we're not forced to, it's not a liturgical requirement. Uh, some do, some don't, but I like the discipline of the lectionary. So obviously, you know, I, I'm not about cherry picking and just grabbing a text and then saying, look, today I'm going to talk about domestic violence and I've, I've found a text that kind of fits. So, so you know, it's a matter of, of, of finding the text, waiting for the text and then developing it and, you know, addressing the issue. But again, you know, for me, I don't want to sound like a crack, crack record, but, you know, there's a lot of excellent work by sociologists by philosophers, by psychologists, um, by policymakers on domestic violence, right? Social workers. Um, and, you, you know, you could spend the whole sermon picking the teeth out of that and, you know, what's the source of the problem? What, what are some psychological strategies to deal with the problem? You know, that's not therapeutic preaching for, for me, you know. Um, I mean, we're not talking about a social work seminar or a social work, work workshop or, a, a, you know, a therapy group for survivors of uh, domestic violence. So from the pulpit, something's got to happen that's centred in God's word. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't mean that, that you, you can't draw some information and some ideas that are extra biblical. But... But that, that should not be the majority of the sermon, mm -hmm. in my in my in my view. That's my my. Do you, do you think that with therapeutic preaching, pastoral care, that it's changed over the years that you've been going to church? So I've heard people say to me the idea of uh, pastoral visits to parishioners' homes. That's that's by the wayside now. Priests just don't do it as much as they used to. Do you see therapeutic preaching in the same way that it's kind of we did it more in the past and now we're doing less of it or it was never yeah I, I i think that there's been a, a big move in protestantism um, because of the declining numbers and the panic around that you know it is the, the the church going to end on our watch so to speak so the the need to grow the church and and a lot of work on mission on evangelism, on church planting. Um, and uh, so my friend, Stephen Patterson, who I think is one of the most interesting thinkers about pastoral care, he's now retired, he's an Englishman, but he wrote an article, um, is pastoral care dead in the, in the world of the mission center of the church? And his answer was, well, largely, you know, because, you know, Pastors, priests, ministers, whatever term you want to use, uh, are turning away from pastoral care in droves and becoming um, disciplers who, who are trying to uh, equip disciples to spread the good news and, and to convert people to Christianity and bring them along to church. So, and therapeutic preaching is a bit in that category that, you know, it's a lost category. 
either I'm going to be the sort of preacher that preaches every Sunday on save the whales and save the climate, or I'm going to be the sort of preacher that every week says, you know, uh, there are all those souls that are heading for hell, so get out there and save them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm speaking very crudely, but you know, we've, no, only, no, got, no, good. we've only got a, a limited period of time, so I, I don't want to have a highly nuanced answers that go for half an hour. No, no, much, uh, much appreciated. With your visiting the different churches that you did in the past, I know you said a bit more settled, but in the past, did, did you see what you wanted to see, as in were there people doing the therapeutic preaching? Yeah, so I, I certainly have seen good exemplars of that. Um, and the, it's, it's my personal preference, but my personal preference is for a both and. I like both and in everything to do with Christianity, you know, social justice and evangelism, mm -hmm. therapeutic preaching and prophetic preaching. You know, I don't like these dichotomies. You know, it's all this, it's all that. Um, so for me, I like preachers that one week it's a, a sermon that's addressing domestic violence, another week it's a sermon that's addressing refugees, and another week it's about, you know, being a disciple who's sharing her or his faith with co-workers, with friends, you know, sort of not fixated on one thing, you know. Um, there's nothing worse than, than thinking... I'm sitting in this pew and I know that sooner or later the preacher's going to get to topic X because that's all I ever talk about. Oh. So the only interesting thing is how are they going to get from this text, which is not about their favourite topic, how are they going to get from this text to their favourite topic? That's the only interesting thing because you know where it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. And so the best preachers I've come across are ones that take the text seriously and don't sort of stretch it to fit their favourite themes. But okay, so it's on this. It mightn't be my favourite theme in life. You know, I'm not really much an evangelist, but I can appreciate that sharing the good news is what happened in the Bible a lot, so we should be doing it. Uh, or maybe someone says, look, I'm more of an evangelist. I'm not really into, you know, supporting refugees and caring for the climate, but I recognise that it's God's world and refugees are God's people and, and they need support. So the text seems to be pointing in that kind of general direction. So I need to address that. That's what I really get excited about in, you know, in a preacher. And I've come across a number of preachers like that, but I've come across sadly other preachers where it's, oh, hang on, here we are. We're, we're back at that again. It's interesting you said about the, the moderate position, because it seems that even outside of religion, that always gets attacked. If you're a moderate, you get attacked from yes, both right. sides. Yes, that's right. And yeah, I, I, I always feel I'm apologising for being in the middle, um, but I, I like the both ends, you know. Um, uh, there is a sort of a personality where they get into something and, and it's they're almost tunnel vision. That's all that matters. That's all they think about. That's all they talk about. There is a personality type like that, you know. Um, and there are people that really want to be at, at the edges, either right at the right wing or right at the left wing. And there are those of us that say, well, hang on, but some of what the left wing is saying is good and some of what the right wing is saying is good. And I don't really want to be at either end, you know. And as I say, you tend to get attacked for that because you seem to be trying to please everybody. You, know, you don't stand for anything. Really. You know, you're both in. It's better to be either or. Just pick a side, you know. Um, but anyway, that's where I am. <laughs> yeah. Better or worse. When you're, uh, Long live the moderates. Yeah. That's right. That's right. When your book uh, came out, the one that you were sort of reflecting on, were you surprised by the reaction from people? Yeah, look, the, the most disappointing reaction was one guy who um, sort of was quite critical. And I, I don't mind people being quite critical. And obviously, no author loves it, but I, I don't. I've got you know, I've got been in academic life now for a very long time, so I've got used to being criticised because you have to be. If you put your work out in the public domain, you're going to get some support and you're going to get some criticism. But what really made me sad was that he kind of 
missed the point of what I was trying to do, which was to make a theological case for what I believe in, which is theocentric therapeutic preaching. So I did that over about four or five chapters. And then in the final chapter, what I did was say, well, here's two full length sermons. One that's kind of the comfort, support, healing, transforming, love of God sermon. Um, and one is really the more sermon of God challenging us, God confronting us with our, our blind spots and our dark side and our sin and so on. So, you know, the two aspects of therapeutic preaching I was trying to display. So the, the whole sermons were reproduced, you know, sort of six-page sermons were reproduced. And then it was probably about a 10-page commentary on each one. You know, this is what I'm doing, basically, step by step, commentating on what, what I was trying to do in the sermons. And he said in his critique, um, way too much theology. I, there was only two sermons. I, I wanted lots of how-to tips, you know, just tell me step one, step two, step three, step four. And that sort of saddened me, really, because many people think practical theology should be like that. It should be writing how-to books, you know, that you can read it in the morning when, you, you know, when you're out you know, doing gardening or something, you know, you'll read your book and it's done, um, or listen to an audio tape as you're driving to work. Um, but what I try to do with practical theology is go a bit deeper and say, you know, there's got to be a good theological argument for what we're doing. Um, it's not just what works, you know. Things can work, but be theologically wrong-headed. So that, that was probably the reaction that saddened me most, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Has your view on the book changed when you sort of, as time's gone on, have you sort of changed your mind on some of the things that you um, wrote or has it kind of been reinforced? Yeah, look, some, sometimes that's happened. And that's a very sad thing about being an author because, you know, you get so used to changing things on your computer screen. You wake up one morning and you think, oh, that, that chapter's not right. I've got to change that. So you change it and then change it and then you change it over about a 12 month period. And then there comes a point where you, the contract says December 15th manuscript due. So you submit it. And then you wake up one morning and think, oh, you know, I could improve that. And you, hang on. <laughs> it's, it's, it's with the publisher. I can't change it anymore. So, uh, but not with this book, you know, I really like what I've done with this book. I think, I think it, it's what I really wanted to say and I'm happy with the model. And I never really expected that, um, you know, I'd get reviews sort of saying that, you know, this is a bestseller and, uh, and can ropes hit on something big. And, you know, I never expected that because it's going against the tide. Um, so, I'm, I'm happy with what I've done. And, you know, if, if a, a, a particular cohort of preachers pick it up and say, yep, this is useful, then I'm happy. I made a contribution. Excellent. Uh, and it's die, for something. Die a happy man. <laughs> and it's for something very important. Now, for those that may watch this, I'm mindful they might be sitting there going, oh, why doesn't he ask him this question or that question? For those that are thinking that, you can actually still ask because you can contact the Australian Student Christian Movement and we will forward the question on, if that's okay with you, uh, yeah. Professor. So please don't sit there going, oh, if only you asked him this or that. Um, you can still ask him, even though you're not with us now. No. I'll, I'll finish with that. Thank you so much for joining. I really do appreciate it. And it's an incredibly Pleasure. important um, topic, therapeutic preaching, pastoral care. So thank you so much for writing the book. and and talking about it. It's been my pleasure. Thank, thank you for the invitation. And to all the listeners, I hope you found something helpful there. <laughs>